So um, this ad is sponsored by Anchor. If you haven't heard about Anchor, it's the easiest way to make a podcast. Let me explain. It's free. There's creation tools that allow you to record and edit your podcast right from your phone or computer. Anchor will distribute your podcast for you so it can be heard on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, and many more. You can make money from your podcast with no minimum listenership. It's everything you need to make a podcast in one place. Download the free Anchor app or go to anchor.fm to get started. Hi there, this is Robin Norgren. I'm your host for Montessori Creativity and the Meaning of Life. You can find all the work that I do on Instagram under Robin underscore Norgren or on my website at www.josiesartschool.com. I'd like to start with some words from The Creative Habit by Twyla Tharp. Creativity is not just for artists. It's for business people looking for a new way to close a sale. It's for engineers trying to solve a problem. It's for parents who want their children to see the world in more than one way. Over the past four decades, I have been engaged in one creative pursuit or another every day in both my professional and personal life. I've thought a great deal about what it means to be creative and how to go about it efficiently. I've also learned from the painful experience of going about it in the worst possible way. I'll tell you about both. I'll give you exercises that will challenge some of your creative assumptions to make you stretch, get stronger, last longer. After all, you stretch before you jog, you loosen up before you work out, you practice before you play. It's no different for your mind. I will keep stressing the point about creativity being augmented by routine and habit. Get used to it. In these pages is a philosophical tug of war will periodically rear its head. It is the perennial debate, born in the Romantic era, era, between the beliefs that all creative acts are born of some a transcend, transcendent, inexplicable, DNC in act of inspiration, a kiss from God on your brow that allows you to give the world the magic flute, or b hard work. If it isn't obvious already, I come down on the side of hard work. That's why the book is called The Creative Habit. Creativity is a habit, and the best creativity is a result of good work habits. That's it in a nutshell. The film Amadeus and the play by Peter Schaeffer on which it's based dramatizes and romanticizes the divine origins of creative genius. Antonio Salieri, representing the talented hack, is cursed to live in the time of Mozart, the gifted and undisciplined genius who writes as though touched by the hand of God. Salieri recognizes the depths of Mozart's genius and is tortured that God has chosen someone so unworthy to be his divine creative vessel. Of course, this is hogwash. There are no natural geniuses. Mozart was his father's son. Leopold Mozart had gone through an arduous education, not just in music, but also in philosophy and religion. He was a sophisticated, broad-thinking man, famous throughout Europe as a composer and a pedagogue. This is not news to music lovers. Leopold had a massive influence on his young son. I question how much of a natural this young boy was. Genetically, of course, he was probably more inclined to write music than, say, play basketball, since he was only three feet tall when he captured the public's attention. But his first good fortune was to have a father who was a composer and a virtuoso on the, vi- on the violin, who could approach keyboard instruments with skill, and who, upon recognizing some ability in his son, said to himself, This is interesting. He likes music. Let's see how far we can take this. Leopold taught the young Wolfgang everything about music, including counterpoint and harmony. 
He saw to it that the boy was exposed to everyone in Europe who was writing good music and could be of use in Wolfgang's musical development. Destiny, quite often, is a determined parent. Mozart was hard, hardly naive, some naive prodigy who sat down at the keyboard and, with God whispering in his ears, let the music flow from his fingertips. It's a nice image for selling tickets to movies, but whether or not God has kissed your brow, you still have to work. Without learning and preparation, you won't know how to harness the power of that kiss. Nobody worked harder than Mozart. By the time he was 28 years old, his hands were deformed because of all the hours he spent practicing, performing, and gripping a quilt pen to compose. That's the missing element in the popular portrait of Mozart. Certainly, he had a gift that set him apart from others. He was the most complete musician imaginable, one who wrote for all the instruments in all combinations, and no one has written greater music for the human voice. Still, few people, even those hugely gifted, are capable of capable of the application and focus that Mozart displayed throughout his short life. As Mozart himself wrote to a friend, people err who think my art comes easily to me. I assure you, dear friend, nobody has devoted so much time and thought to composition as I. There is not a famous master whose music I have not industriously studied through many times. Mozart's focus was fierce. It had to be for him to deliver the music he did in his relatively short life, under the conditions he endured, writing in coaches and delivering scores just before the curtain went up, dealing with the distractions of raising a family and the constant need for money. Whatever scope and grandeur you attach to Mozart's musical gift, his so-called genius, his discipline, and work ethic were its equal. I'm sure this is what Leopold Mozart saw so early in his son, who as a three-year-old one day impulsively jumped up on the stool to play his older sister's harp harpichord and was immediately smitten. Music quickly became Mozart's passion, his preferred activity. I seriously doubt that Leopold had to tell his son for very long, get in there and practice your music. The child did it on his own. More than anything, this book is about preparation. In order to be creative, you have to know how to prepare to be creative. No one can give you your subject matter, your creative content. If they could, it would be their creation and not yours. But there's a process that generates creativity and you can learn it. And you can make it habitual. There's a paradox in the notion that creativity should be a habit. We think of creativity as a way of keeping everything fresh and new, while habit implies routine and repetition. That paradox intrigues me because it occupies the place where creativity and skill rub up against each other. It takes skill to bring something you've imagined into the world, to use words to create believable lives, to select the colors and textures of paint to represent a haystack at sunset, to combine ingredients to make a flavorful dish. No one is born with that skill. It is developed through exercise, through repetition, through a blending of learning and reflection that's both painstaking and rewarding. And it takes time. Even Mozart, with all his innate gifts, his passion for music, and his father's beloved tutelage needed to get 24 youthful symphonies under his belt before he composed something enduring with number 25. If art is the bridge between what you see in your mind and what the world sees, then skill is how you build that bridge. Words from Daniel Laporte's book, White Hot Truth. When we start to develop unconditional acceptance of ourselves, then we are really taking care of ourselves in a way that pays off. 
a way that builds inner strength instead of outer dependencies. A way that expands us so that we can accommodate more pain and more joy. A way that grows us. Deep growth happens when our self-care is a celebration of our goodness and value and not a fixation of what needs to be fixed. It's a life-affirming attentiveness that steers us inward for the answers. Eventually, we stop looking for signs from the universe that we are loved, and we start finding signs everywhere that we love ourselves. Number one, you start where you are and love what you can. Consider that love, like truth and light, exists on a spectrum. On one end, we have hesitant kind of love. On the other end, the scale is free-flowing, certain, pure love. If you want to grow in love for who you are, you love what you can on any given day. And let that guide you out of the darkness toward bigger, brighter love. Some days, all you'll be able to, to muster is loving the color of your eyes or how organized you keep your desk. Brilliant. Pick something, anything, to keep your mind off loathing. Other days, you'll know with electric certainty that you are a magnificent, connected creature and that love of air with your truth will be your protection, your guide, and your reason for being. Number two. You practice good manners with yourself. We self-help overachievers can berate ourselves for our suffering. We can and do things to ourselves that we'd never do to other people. Would you treat anyone else like that? Would you talk to a child like that? Love is patient. Love is kind. Love says, you poor thing, no wonder you feel this way. It's been tough. Just like your best friend would say after you poured your heart out to her. You don't need a pep talk or a meditation to distract you. You just need some empathy for yourself. Number three. You allow your light to be reflected back to you. When you can't rally some compassion for yourself, then seek it out from your friends and heroes in a healthy way. That's the beauty of being in this together we can reflect our lovability to each other. When we're blind to our own light, someone with open eyes can describe it to us. But you're amazing and resourceful and so kind and totally hot. Number four, you hang out with people who love you. This is an elitist or self-help snobbery. It's a minimum health requirement. You grow most most vigorously in conditions of kindness, resonance, and good laughter. You don't look at relationships like spiritual boot camp, even though they are. You keep your intense circle full of fellow love crusaders. It only takes one other person to have an inner circle. Number five, you prioritize pleasure. After years of being hard on ourselves... And staying stuck in karmic circles, pleasure-making is courageous. Pleasure heals. Pleasure makes all of the seemingly unavoidable hardships of just being here so much easier. And your pleasure empowers you, and you know it. Number six, you reward yourself for trying. You don't reward yourself only if you achieve what you set out to do. And you don't set up consequences if you fail. You you commend yourself for showing up because loving is an unending process, not a finish line. Number seven, you go beyond tolerating your so-called shortcomings to actually accepting more parts of yourself. You may think that tolerating your foibles is an achievement in self-compassion, but tolerance is not the same as acceptance. Tolerance keeps you on guard. You are effectively only managing degrees of irritation with yourself. Instead, you accept that, for now anyway, this is what you got to work with. Strengths and weaknesses. 
doing this creates an intimacy with yourself that cannot be interrupted. Number eight, you befriend your loneliness. An ancient philosopher said that on the journey to enlightenment, you go from being alone to alone. The big alone is what it feels like to experience yourself as the center of your universe. It's a big job. The upside is that this sense of isolation makes us more responsive and available to connect with the world. We care for our loneliness and we care for others. So we care more about what we're creating in the world. From my book, Deep in the Way You Live Your Life. Are you living your life in your flow? Linda Sakakashio said, When we are enthusiastic, we are intoxicated with passion, rooted in our true selves, and it flows into all we do. Flow. Where do you find it in your life? What amount of time do you spend in this area of flow? What intoxicates you with passion? Is it the same place that you spend most of your time? How can you bring yourself more into the flow of your gifts? <music>